Okay, so get ready to dive deep, deep into the history of the internet. But, you know, forget those images of sterile server rooms. Forget Silicon Valley for a second. Yeah, we're going way back. This story, it starts with something way more, well, dramatic, right? Right. Cold War. Yeah, the Cold War. It's 1957, and uh, the U.S. is kind of freaking out because the Soviet Union has just launched Sputnik. Not just a satellite, though, right? I mean, this was like a big, giant metal wake-up call, right? Kickstarted it's, the whole space race thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. And the U.S., you know, they weren't going to just sit back. They realized they had to, like, seriously up their tech game. Right. And that's where DARPA comes in. DARPA was supposed to be this, like, this powerhouse of innovation. And, well, you know, it ended up being crucial to the Internet as we know it today. Okay. So we've got Sputnik. We've got the U.S. creating DARPA. But... Help me connect the dots here a little. How does this fear, this fear of being outpaced in like the tech race, how does that lead to the internet? Seems like a bit of a leap. Well, it's bigger than just keeping up, right? Imagine you're, let's say, a military leader, maybe a scientist, and suddenly you've got to face this very real possibility that the Soviets could just, I don't know, take out the entire phone system. Wow. That's not just an inconvenience. We're talking about a potential communication blackout. Right when clear communication is the most important thing. So it was like that old duck and cover mentality, but it wasn't just about bombs. It was about like information warfare, too. Yeah, exactly. Information was key. And this fear, I mean, it really fueled some seriously groundbreaking ideas. That's where a guy named J.C.R. Licklider comes in. This guy, he was a psychologist and a computer scientist, worked at DARPA. Okay. And in 1962, he just drops this... I don't know, almost like sci-fi idea. Yeah. An intergalactic network of computers. Intergalactic network. Okay, that sounds like straight out of Star Trek. Were people even, like, were they following him at this point? Did they get it? It was visionary. Think of it this way. Mm -hmm. A backup communication system, but not just any backup. We're talking about something so robust, so spread out, that there was no way an enemy could take it down with just one attack. And this wasn't about, you know, posting cat videos or whatever. Right, right. This was about making sure the U.S. could maintain command and control even if, you know, even if the un unthinkable happened. So the Internet, the thing that we use for, like, pretty much everything these days, it was born out of Cold War anxiety. That's kind of wild. It is pretty wild, right? Yeah. It shows how sometimes, you know, the best inventions, the most important innovations, they come from necessity, from this urgent need to solve a problem. And the thing is, this problem that they were trying to solve, it wasn't just, like, theoretical. It really shaped those early principles of the Internet. How so? It had to be resilient. It had to be decentralized. Yeah. Those qualities, they're still with us today. They still kind of define how we use the Internet. Wow. Okay, so we've got this this vision, right? This intergalactic network. But how do you even start to build something like that? I mean, this had never existed before. And that's where things get really, really interesting because the tech, the big technological leap that made all of this possible, it actually came before Licklider's big idea. Oh, really? So the tech was just ready and waiting. Like they didn't even know what they were going to do with it yet. Kind of. Yeah. In 1965, there's this British scientist, Donald Davies, and he comes up with this revolutionary idea Something he called packet switching. Packet switching. Okay, for those of us who weren't around back then, break that down. What is that? Okay, imagine this. You're trying to send a message, right? But instead of sending the whole thing all at once, you chop it up into little pieces. Okay. Almost like you're putting every sentence on a different postcard. These packets of information, they get sent out independently through the network, and they each, like, find their own best route to get where they're going. So even if some of those postcards get lost or, like, delayed... The message still gets through. Exactly. And this was completely different from how things were done before. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was all about this single dedicated connection. But packet switching, that meant the network could be way more resilient, way more reliable, you know, even if things got messy. That's so smart. It's like instead of sending one carrier pigeon with the whole message, you're sending it out with the whole flock. There you go. That's a great way to put it. And that breakthrough, that was crucial for what they were trying to do with the ARPANET, you know, the precursor to the Internet. Right, right. It had to be tough, had to withstand the disruptions, even, you know, even a full-blown attack. Without packet switching, it wouldn't have been nearly as effective. It wouldn't have worked. Wow. Okay, so we've got the vision from Licklider. We've got this groundbreaking technology packet switching. We're ready to hit the launch button, right? Almost. Almost, but not quite. Let me set the scene for you. October 29th, 1969. 
we've got these two giant computers. I'm talking room size. These things were huge. One at UCLA, one at Stanford. Okay. And they're about to make history, setting the very first message over this brand new ARPANET. This is it, the internet's big debut. What was the message heard around the world? Something inspiring, I hope. Log in. Log in, come on, that's, that's it. You'd think they'd go with something a little more, you know, profound for the history books. Well, it might have been, except uh, things didn't exactly go as planned. Oh, what happened? Oh, what happened? Well, they got as far as the low and crash, the system crash. Well, wait, are you serious? Oh. All that work, all that build up in the internet's first words were low. Yeah, it's a <laughs> That's a pretty good story, right? Talk about like an epic fail. It does. It makes you realize that even these, you know, big groundbreaking inventions, they have their, uh, their glitches. Their first try isn't always perfect. Right, right. But even though that first attempt was, you know, kind of a funny story now, it showed them, hey, this concept, this crazy idea, it works. So system crash aside, this is still a big moment. It's like, I don't know, the Wright brothers, their first flight. It might have been short, but it proved that something amazing was possible. So where do we go from low? Where does the story of the internet go next? That's where the real story begins. Okay. So all through the 1970s, the ARPANET, even with that little hiccup at the beginning, it starts growing like crazy. More universities, more research places, they all get connected. It even crosses the ocean to London, to Norway. Wow, so we went from low to a global network in just a few years. That's incredible how fast things were developing. It is, but here's the thing, with all this growth, a new problem pops up. See, the ARPANET, it was just one of many computer networks around. Oh, okay. And each one, it had its own, I guess, its own personality, its own oh. way of communicating. The real trick was how to get them to, you know, how to get these different networks to actually talk to each other. Ah, so it's like having like a room full of people, but they all speak different languages. You need a common language if you want everyone to understand each other. Perfect analogy. Mm. And that's where Vinton Cerf enters the picture. Brilliant guy, computer scientist working with ARPANET. And he develops this thing, TCPIP. Stands for Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. Catchy, very catchy. Yeah, not the best name, but hey, it was the missing piece of the puzzle. So what does it do? What is TCPIP? Think of it as the common language, the universal translator for all those different networks. Like it sets the rules. How do you break the information down? How do you address it, mm. send it, put it back together at the other end? TCPIP made sure that any computer, didn't matter what its operating system was, what network it was on, they could all talk to each other. So like TCPIP was the internet's Rosetta Stone. Let them all finally speak in unison. It's amazing to think that something so basic, I mean, something we just totally take for granted now, it was once this huge obstacle. Totally. Mm. And it's easy to forget, even with this new ability to connect everything, the internet, as we know it, it still wasn't there yet. It wasn't. No. No cat videos, no social media. Back then, it was mostly scientists, researchers, sharing data, sending files. Wow. Okay, so we've got this network, we've got this common language. What's next? When does it transform, you know, from this niche tool to the internet? That's where things take another, well, another fascinating turn. We're going to 1991 to a physics lab CERN in Switzerland. Okay. And we're going to meet a man named Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee. Now, that is a name I recognize. Didn't he invent the World Wide Web? He did. But here's the thing. A lot of people get this wrong. They think the World Wide Web and the internet are the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what is the difference? Think about it like this. The internet... That's like the foundation, the network of computers, the cables, all this stuff that lets information travel around the world. The World Wide Web, that's how we access that information, how we interact with it. It's like, you know, the roads, the highways mm -hmm. built on top of that foundation. So Berners-Lee, he didn't invent the Internet itself, but he invented how we use it. You got it. That's still a pretty huge deal, though. It's a huge deal. Berners-Lee, his idea was to create this system where anyone could share information, anyone could could access it no matter where they were. He wanted to break down all the walls and make knowledge, you know, truly universal. Mm -hmm. And the tools he came up with, hyperlinks, URLs, HTML, those are the building blocks of the web as we know it. It's actually hard to picture the internet without those things. No clicking on links, no typing in websites. It wouldn't even be the internet. Exactly. It's easy to forget how revolutionary it was. Imagine, no hyperlinks. You can't just jump from one piece of information to another. Berners-Lee changed how we think, how we interact with information completely. It makes you appreciate how much work, how many different people, how many ideas went into making the internet what it is today. Totally. And the best part, the story's not over yet. 
the web, just like the internet before it was about to go through this huge explosive, I don't know, transformation. We've gone from Cold War fears to low to the World Wide Web. What comes next in this digital saga? Well, you got to remember, at this point, the web, it was still kind of, you know, stuck in the world of universities, research labs. It was about to become a whole lot more accessible and a whole lot more interesting. This is where things get really interesting for those of us who weren't computer science whizzes back in the 90s. Tell me more. Well, the game changer was this little thing called Mosaic. Mosaic. Okay, that one's not ringing any bells for me. So Mosaic, it was the first really user-friendly web browser. Before that, navigating the web, it was clunky. Even if you knew what you were doing, it was a pain. Right. But Mosaic, it changed everything. Suddenly you could see images, you could see text all together, you could click on hyperlinks. It opened up a whole new world. So this was the beginning of like the point and click internet, the internet we all know and love. That's it. And it wasn't just Mosaic. Other browsers came out too. Netscape Navigator, that was a big one, made the web even easier to use. It's hard to explain how big of a deal this was. Suddenly the internet wasn't this like abstract thing anymore. It was a visual experience. It was interactive. It must have felt like the Wild West, right? Like so much to explore, everything brand new. A great way to put it. Big. And it gets even wilder. In 1992, the U.S. government, they make this huge decision. They say, okay, businesses can use the internet now. Whoa. So that was the moment right there. That's when it went from this like exclusive club to like the internet. You got it. That decision, it was like, boom. Entrepreneurs everywhere, they saw the potential. That's when you get Amazon, eBay, all these companies that changed how we live, how we work, how we like function. It's mind blowing. Something that started with like Cold War paranoia, something <laughs> that was just for scientists to share boring data. It ends up changing the entire global economy. It just goes to show you innovation. You can't predict it. Yeah. And it doesn't slow down. Think about it. We went from dial up, you know, that awful sound waiting forever to connect to broadband instant access all the time. We went from those giant computers to laptops to smartphones. And it all happens so fast, like a couple of decades, that's it. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around it. It is. It really is. And none of it would happen without those early pioneers, the oh. ones who like dared to dream. It's they imagined this world where information could travel freely instantly. Mm -hmm. They didn't always get it right, remember, it low, but they kept at it. They pushed the limits. And here we are. Yeah. Makes you think about all the things we take for granted now. Being able to talk to anyone, anywhere, anytime, finding information in like a split second, all those things, they came from somewhere. They came from people, from ideas, from a lot of hard work and maybe even some lucky accidents along the way. Absolutely. It makes you wonder, what are we working on right now that seems small, that seems insignificant, but it's actually going to like change everything? What's the next low? What's going to be that spark for the next digital revolution? It's pretty exciting to think about. It really is. And on that note, we'll leave you all with that thought. The internet, it reminds us that we're living in a time of incredible change. What seems normal today, who knows what it'll look like in five, 10 years. What new frontiers are out there? What new possibilities are waiting for us? Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the surprisingly human story of how we got here. And here's to seeing what amazing things we come up with next. 